Matthew I'm Creek Primitive Baptist Church. If you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to turn to the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the most revolutionary sermon ever given. It's a sermon that starts out with these wonderful words, blessed. It's blessed, and he's talking to a ragtag group of people who have called him up on the hill, and they did not think they were blessed because they had been oppressed by the Romans. They had been oppressed by their own people, the spiritual leaders, who had turned faith in God into this legalistic list of do's and don'ts. And Jesus comes to him, he says, you are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and seek after righteousness. It's not because you are righteous, it's because you realize you're not and you're just hungering for it. Blessed are the meek, not, not people who are powerful, not to the jock and to the Heisman Trophy winner, but the meek people. And he goes through this list and the people are just like, wow. It's revolutionary. Blessed are you in the year 2020 who are experiencing COVID. Blessed are you who have parents that are suffering from Alzheimer's. Blessed are you whose children just don't listen to you. They're not, they're not following your rules. They're walking away from you, and they're doing things that you just stress you out to the max. Blessed. That's what the message would be here in 2020. And so Jesus starts off the message with the Sermon on the Mount, just kind of redefining what it is to be blessed. And I'm thankful he is because right now in 2020, a lot of us are stressed because some of us have lost our jobs or we're facing unemployment. And we've got all kinds of stress. And it's really good to know that in that situation, we're blessed. It's good to know that when we're facing down medical diagnoses that challenges us, that we're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed. Then Jesus goes to the next point because when ragtag groups of people hear the word blessed, there's a tendency to think, well, maybe God has lowered his standards. And Jesus says, no, God did not lower his standards. Not one jot, not one tittle is going to be changed from the law. God did not lower his standards. And oh, well, this kind of ties into the message of grace because God never lowered his standards. But Jesus met those standards, and he applied them to his family, his elect. The, the elect that outnumber the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky, a number so vast that no man can number it. And then Jesus goes in to say, well, you know what? Up there is coming down here. Y'all are blessed now because I've come unto the scene, and now you get to do life with God through me. Blessed are you. So let's go ahead and talk about those things which really affect the human condition. And he jumps in and he talks about anger. And then he jumps in and he talks and anger, and then he goes, you know, how it manifests itself in condemnation, something that so easily kind of traps us. And then he says, okay, now let's, let's talk about sex and intimacy. And he says, y'all think just because you've never committed adultery that you're okay sexually. He says, no, you're not. If you've looked at a woman and go, hubba hubba, you're just as guilty as if you've committed adultery. And then Jesus goes into the next section, which we're going to talk about today, where anger and, and sexual um, problems kind of manifest itself ultimately, and that's on the topic of divorce. Now, I want to go ahead and say at the very beginning of my message, there's going to be some people that hear this message now, and there's going to be some people that hear this message online, and their head is going to go, I've never heard it like that before. And that's okay. Because when the people heard the Sermon on the Mount, they went, I've never heard grace like that before. Because somewhere in the Baptist background, we got a little bit askew on the topic of divorce. And the concept was something like this, if you know much about Baptist history, that you have to stay married except and unless one of the partner commits adultery. And that is the only situation where you're allowed to get a divorce. And that is not the teaching of the Bible. And that is not the teaching of Jesus Christ. If you are a woman and you are in a physically abusive relationship, get out. If you're a woman and you're in an emotionally abusive relationship, get out. If you have married a man who is not going to provide food or raiment, get out. And the Bible completely authorizes that. And I hope that if you will, you'll follow with me in the Bible because I can prove this to you by Scripture. And then you have a fresh concept of what it means when Jesus comes to the scene and he said, blessed are the people that are angry because I'm here. Blessed are the people who are, who are sexually frustrated because I'm here. Blessed are the people who are divorced or going through divorce because I'm here. I'm not going to abandon you. 
So these are the words of Scripture. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to read the passage. It's Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. And Jesus says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. And these are Jesus' words on this passage, and it ties into a section when the Pharisees came to him in Matthew chapter 19, and they ask him a question, hey, uh, is it okay to divorce anybody for any reason? And Jesus says, I'm telling you, save for the cause of adultery. No, it's not. And so what has happened in Baptist history is where we got the false notion that only adultery justifies a divorce. But remember, right before this, Jesus has said, not one jot, not one tittle, has passed from the law. And what that means is we actually have to go back to the Old Testament laws on divorce and look at what the Old Testament laws were. And then if we look at it contextually, we'll be able to see what Jesus is really talking about. So if you got your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you because Jesus is trying to tell us how things are going to be in the kingdom. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, and I'd really encourage everybody today to follow along with me and not just hear it, but I want you to see it. There's something about the learning pyramid that you only remember 5% of what you hear, but you remember 15 to 20% of what you see. So it's really important for me that you see what we're talking about. So pull up your Bibles, grab one from the pew, or whip it out on your phone. But we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Let me turn to that real quick. This is one... This is one of the passages in the Old Testament on divorce. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanliness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of a house. So let's pause right there. In just a minute, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 21 because that's the other Old Testament passage on divorce. So one of the things that's kind of cool about our Lord is our Lord is the one that for the first time really instituted women's rights. Because up until this point in the Mosaic Law, women had no rights. They could be traded like chattel left and right, and they could be just left and be abandoned in their old age, even though they had devoted their whole lives to a man, the man could just push her to the side like an old used car and just go on his way, and women had no rights. And so when the Mosaic Law came around through God for the first time, God is instituting women's rights. God is pro-women's rights. And so what he's doing is he's saying, look, men, if you have a divorce, this is what you need to do. You need to give her a certificate of divorcement. It was a right that a woman had, and a certificate of divorcement always carried this phrase, that she is free to remarry another Jewish man. Because back then, as you know, ladies did not have the same kinds of rights as men. And um, so you always had the right to remarry. And Deuteronomy mentions here divorce for this reason. The grounds of uncleanliness, and the Hebrew actually rendered it sexual immorality. So that actually kind of raises a question. Well, it says here about immorality, but what about in other cases like abandonment, like abuse, like like some of these other things that, that happen in marriages? And that's when we go to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. So if you've got your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 21, verse 10 and 11. Exodus chapter 21, verse 10 and 11. Exodus chapter 21, verse 10 and 11. Because in a polygamous culture, people would marry. (laughs) They get a divorce. And this is what it says. And if if he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. And if he do not these three unto her, then shall she go out free without money. She is free to leave him if he doesn't provide food, doesn't provide raiment, doesn't provide the duty of love. So you see, 
women have rights in this situation. And it's not just that if there's immorality in the equation. Men, you are responsible to provide for your wife. Men, you are responsible to love your wife. Now, y'all have heard probably if you've watched any TV shows about this thing in the law called precedent. Okay, so the law says, the law, real, the law right here says, you got to provide food, you got to provide raiment, and you have to provide the duty of love, which so you know is intimacy. But that begs the question, well, how often? Duty of love. And rabbis actually would meet and they would talk about things like this. And so the rabbis had, came up with this equation. They said, look, if you're a married man, you owe your wife intimacy twice a week. That, there's actual rabbinic laws talking about this. And then it would make exceptions. However, this is true. I'm not making this up. If you are a donkey driver, you only owe it once a week. And so that would be kind of like being a truck driver. You know, I guess it's an extra hard job. However, the rabbis came together and said, if you are unemployed, you owe it every single day. That's what the rabbis came up with. So you know, <laughs> I don't want anybody, hey, honey, we got to go back to the Mosaic Law, and by the way, I'm quitting. <laughs> okay, that's the only humor we're going to have today. <laughs> But these are actual things, and so that's what's called, that's not what's written into the law, but that's how they kind of colored between the lines, and that's what's called case precedent. And it was binding on people, and so rabbis would get together and they would debate these kinds of things. Well, one of the debates that the rabbis had was going back to Deuteronomy chapter 24. And there were two prevailing rabbis of the day. There was Rabbi Hillel. He was a very liberal rabbi. And then there was a very conservative rabbi by the name of Rabbi Shammai. And so they go back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, and Deuteronomy chapter 24, and remember the primary purpose that the men owed was they owed provision and they owed love. And so they go back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, where it says, when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanliness in her. And in the Hebrew phrasing, that because he has found some uncleanliness in her can be both an independent clause and a dependent clause. And so it, uh, he has found no favor. Does, and the debate was, does the uncleanliness modify the no favor or is it a standalone clause? And the rabbi sat around and they debated this. And what happened with the rabbis is the liberal theologian Hillel said, well, it's an independent clause. The two are separate. You can find a bill of divorcement because there was uncleanliness in her, or you can find a bill of divorcement because she has found no favor in your eyes because she has burnt the toast, because she has not cooked the bacon. Well, they didn't have bacon, but you get the idea. Because she has watched consecutive Hallmark movies. <laughs> but literally, the rabbis actually sat around and said, because, you know, if she has cooked a meal that you do not find to your satisfaction, that is finding unfavor. And so under the school of Hillel, what was happening was the liberalization of divorce, and people were getting divorced for any reason whatsoever, and a whole bunch of women were getting kicked to the side. And that was the prevailing view of the day, and that was what was going on. And in Jesus' day, that was the debate. And so, and, and so what was caused when, when Hillel came around and said she had found no favor in his eyes, that was known in that day as a no-cause divorce, a no -ca an any-cause divorce as opposed to a sexual immorality divorce. And the any cause divorce was an absolutely expensive proposition because in any, in a, any cause divorce, if you div divorce her for any cause, then you are on the hook for Exodus chapter 21 of providing food and raiment and the duty of love. In other words, you had to pay alimony. But if you found that she had committed sexual immorality, then you got to kick her out and you are free and you actually see a lot of that in today's uh, Judeo-Christian law on the issues of divorce. 
So that was the issues that were going on in this day, and that was the major debate. And if you don't understand that, then you're going to misinterpret the Scriptures on divorce. Let, let me say about this. It would be kind of like today if I said, well, I think if you're 17, you ought to be allowed to drink if you tweeted that out. Now, I don't think that. But if I said that, I think if you're 17, you ought to be able to allowed to drink. Every one of us in this congregation would understand that I was talking about alcohol, even though I didn't say the words alcohol, right? Everybody in Jesus' day, when they were talking about this issue, understood that when this question was asked of our Savior and when he preached it on the Sermon on the Mount because of the phrasing that he used, that he was talking about the issue of Hillel versus Shammai. And I can tell you that also because when we go to the New Testament teachings on divorce, the Apostle Paul does not teach separately from what Jesus said. Um, so here's what happens when Jesus is going back to the issue of divorce. He actually goes back to the beginning of Torah. In the beginning of Torah, he says, you know, for a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become flesh. And that was over in Matthew chapter 19 when the Pharisees came to him. They asked him about this prevailing issue of the day. In Matthew chapter 19, these are the words of the Lord. And he, and he answered them and says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave the father and mother and shall cleave to a wife and the twain shall become one flesh. And they said unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing a divorcement and to put her away? And he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away from your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Then he says, look, if it's not for sexual immorality, on the issue of any cause divorce, Jesus is saying, I am a Shammai guy on this issue. Jesus is not addressing the issues where men beat their wives, where men verbally abuse their wives, where men are bums and they don't support their wives. Jesus is not addressing that issue. Jesus is addressing the issue of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. And everybody, everybody would understand that. And he's saying, you know, when we're talking about Deuteronomy chapter 21, it is not okay to put away your wife because you don't like the way she bakes bread. That's not okay. You don't get to throw in the towel because she watches consecutive Hallmark movies. You don't get to do that because we are all going to have our struggles. But remember, this is a message that's given during the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the people who are struggling in their marriage. How do we get up there to come down here? And one of the ways to get up there to come down here is not to give up so easily. And it's a shameful statistic that in the Christian church, 50% of marriages, just like outside the Christian church, 50% of marriages end in divorce. And so what happened in Baptist history is something really weird. Baptist history is like no matter how bad it gets, if she doesn't sleep around, then you don't get to divorce her. And if you do, then you don't get to get remarried. And if you do, then you're in a perpetual state of sin and you can never rejoin the church. Absolute lunacy. This is a spiritual hospital for people who are hurting. Amen. Our church and the church of Jesus Christ is for broken people not people who just get to click off the boxes. And if you are a divorcee, if you are going through a divorce, if you are, are just struggling right now, it is okay because you are blessed because you get to turn that situation over to God. Blessed. So Jesus comes and he said... <laughs> I just want y'all to know that we might be declared anathema by about 70% of our sister churches. And if y'all need a new pastor, I understand. I, no, seriously, y'all know how some people are. I mean, there's some people below the nat line that won't have me in their church because of this situation. 
But that's okay. Because I'm blessed. Whether or not I'll be preached or not. But I just want to be honest with you. This is, this is, this is not the prevailing opinion among our primitive Baptist brothers and sisters. And that's okay. Because it aligns with Jesus. And I can show you this. So let's go with the Apostle Paul. Is the Apostle Paul ever going to teach anything contrary to what Jesus Christ taught? The answer is no. So if we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. Paul, wants, Paul writes to the church of Corinth, and you need to know marriage is an institution in Rome. <laughs> in Rome, marriage is not in great shape. Okay, so you had Herod, right, in Jerusalem. So Herod was married to his first wife, and he didn't like his first wife. As a matter of fact, Herod liked his brother's wife. I don't know. <laughs> Her name, oddly enough, was Hodius. And so he divorces his first wife, convinces his brother's wife to divorce her husband, and those two get married. John the Baptist actually called them out on it and got beheaded for that reason. Marriage is not good. So it's only just a few years after this, maybe about 50 years after this, just to kind of give you a flavor. The emperor issued a decree in 18 B.C. that Roman citizens get married, and the decree said that you could get divorced just by walking out the door. That was a Roman law that was instituted in 18 B.C. Just about, you didn't even have to give a bill of divorcement. And that kind of offended the Jewish people because the Jewish people had in the Mosaic law that you had to give a certificate of divorcement, which showed that the woman was, had the right to be remarried. And so the Apostle Paul is kind of addressing this. So there was, in the church of Corinth, there was widespread cohabitation, widespread immorality, widespread forced marriages, and that was the state of the world. And so Paul says, don't do that. Honor your marriage vows. Don't sink down the Roman road. Honor your spouses. And this is what he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord... Let not the wife depart from the husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any man hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away." And if the wife, and if the woman who hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they're holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in, some case, in such cases, but God hath called us unto peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? And so the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, look, if you're married to an unbeliever and the unbeliever is cool with staying with you, then stay with them. That's good because you have a sanctifying effect. It's kind of like being salt to the world, being light on a hill. You can get in there and help them become the man or woman that God has called them to be just by your mere presence. Do you know, children of God, that you have that power? That you can affect the people around you, especially in the marriage relationship. But the Apostle Paul also says, hey, look, if they walk out the door, if they're an unbeliever and they walk out the door, which is the Roman way of saying, I'm divorcing you, let them go. It's okay. And you're free to remarry. Paul has not changed what Jesus says. Paul is actually going back to Exodus chapter 21, where a husband owes food, raiment, and provision, a duty of food, a duty to provide food, raiment, and the duty of love. And he says, if a husband walks out on you, go. If a wife walks out on you as an unbeliever, then go. And I want to point out something else about the Apostle Paul. The sin is not in the divorce. The sin, according to the Apostle Paul, was if your believing husband walks away and you get remarried, you did not stick around for reconciliation. That's where you get wrong. But nowhere do they ever ban anybody from being able to come to church and to worship. So this is the message that Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. 
He starts out with the amazing words, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now let's talk about our issues in life. How can we make the kingdom effective when it comes to anger? How, it, well, if you got anything against your brother, then go and reconcile with him. Be quick to do it. How, and, and for everybody that thinks that you're okay because you've never actually committed the act, let me tell you something. If you've committed the look, you're just as guilty. And oh, by the way, while we're on the topic, if a man divorces a woman he, 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 and he puts her away for the wrong reason, then you're putting her out there and you're not treating her right. Those are the words of Jesus. He says, if it, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. That was the way it was done. But I say that whosoever put away his wife, and this is the Deuteronomy 24 issue, saving for the cause of fornication. Don't do it for any other reason. Don't do it for burnt toast. Don't do it because you don't like the way their hair looks. Don't do it because they have bad breath in the morning. Because when you do that, you commit violence upon them. Why is this issue important to God? And so that takes us to some other parts in the New Testament that we come to. I mean, some other parts in the Old Testament that we come to. Because I want to tell you about another divorce in the Bible. What Jesus is also saying is, look, they said, don't do this because if you, Jesus is saying, if you do this and you're causing your wife to commit adultery, if you put her away for burning the bread, you're causing her to go out and do something that she shouldn't have to do. But you know what? She's blessed. Why is this issue important to Jesus? Why does he put it right up there between anger, between infidelity, and now divorce? It's top three issue for Jesus when it talks about kingdom life. And when we look at the statistics, we know it needs to be a top three issue. Well, the most striking picture that is used to go show God's relationship to Israel that we see over and over again in the Old Testament is the issue of marriage. Because God made a covenant with Israel that he would provide for her, he would care for her, and he would love her, and she was to love him back. But God's people were unfaithful to him. And God loved his people. They were unfaithful. This is one of the most amazing statements in Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. And I saw... When for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I put her away and gave her a bill of divorcement. God goes through a divorce. And in the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi, this is what he says. He says in the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 16, God says, I hate divorce. Literally in the King James, he says, he hateth putting away. He hateth putting away. You know why he hates it? Because he's been through it. Do you hear the anguish in his heart? He says he knows all about the humiliation of being rejected, of broken vows, of broken intimacy, of hard-hearted people, because God himself is a divorcee. And so what happens is God invented a divorce recovery program at a place called Calvary. And the price was a bloodstained cross. And Jesus paid that price for all his children. And God is the first one to go through the program. This is Hosea chapter 2 verse 19. Hosea chapter 2 verse 19. I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness. I'm going to marry you. I'm going to marry you forever. I'm going to marry you in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. There was love and compassion at the cross for hard-hearted, unfaithful people. And that includes you and that includes me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and, and that's why anybody, any church, any theology that beats up on people for divorce and treats them like second-class citizens is wrong. And on the most basic level, this is what God is saying. Every single one of us has been unfaithful. And, 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 and so how do we manage anger, mismanage anger and contentment? And, and let me say, let me just say this too. 
Jesus takes marriage very seriously, and he wants us to fulfill our marriage vows. But we are broken. Being broken is not an excuse to walk out. Struggle to make your marriage work. Struggle. But if it's broken, you can still come to this church and be blessed. Because Jesus says, you are blessed. Because it's not on your ability to be faithful that Jesus' love is contingent. Jesus loved you despite your ability to be faithful. Jesus came to you despite your ability to be faithful because Jesus knows that you are a broken and I am a broken person. Jesus loves his family. And it's not because we were perfect. None of us were. There's none righteous. No, not one. We are altogether unprofitable. We are altogether like sheep who have gone astray. The poison of asps is upon our lips. That's the Bible's description of us. And our righteousness is as filthy rags. Jesus has come for the broken people. So if you right now are in a marriage that you're struggling with, I get it. Because when you got married, you said, you know, she is my soulmate. She is my split apart. She is my one and only, my reason and my answer. But there are times as life goes on that the ways of life just keep on going and you find, man, it is a struggle. And you're just like, I don't know, a toad on the driveway waiting to get run over or something like that. How do you handle this? How do you go it? And there's a passage over in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17, and we're coming to conclusion. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. How do we manage anger? How do we manage contempt? How do we manage intimacy problems? How do we manage this and bad marriages? And if you're not sure where Habakkuk is, it's right between Nahum and Zephaniah, right smack there. So you find Nahum's next book. And so you look between those books. And these were difficult days for Israel because Israel had been unfaithful. And this is what the prophet Habakkuk writes. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, and neither shall be their fruit in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fall, fell, and the field shall yield no meat. So these are so y'all know these are agricultural people, and so when your figs aren't producing, and your olive trees aren't producing, and the vines aren't producing, that's troubled times. So think about it metaphorically in your marriage. Maybe things aren't popping, maybe things aren't working, that's okay. And it says, look, the labor of the olive tree shall fell, and the yield shall yield, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And that's kind of the vision of the kingdom life. Of, of knowing that no matter how bad it gets, the presence and the reality of God and how that changes everything. Blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirits. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are downtrodden and the people with chronic halitosis. Blessed are the people who are struggling in bad marriages because we are all going to face things in this world where circumstances do not turn out the way that I want them to turn out. And sometimes they are really, really difficult circumstances. And it, it just, just sometimes in life I'm going to face circumstances that I don't like, that I can't control. And, and all I have to face them with at least seemingly, is my own inadequacy. And I'm going to spend a huge chunk of my life, if all I focus on is my inadequacies, I'm going, to fo- I'm going to have a huge chunk of my life with discouragement and frustrations. Just kind of give you a, a picture of the way this works. <laughs> um, when I was polishing off the message this week, my computer froze up on me. We're having a little computer issue. Oh, my computer froze up on me. And I just got so frustrated because I don't have the technical know-how that that, that Brother Chris has. And you know how it is. You know, you feel like a seven-year-old. You're just like, ah! So I remember getting up and going to the window and just kind of looking out. And I remember thinking, God, this is a pretty day. 
And you're God of that sunshine, and you're God of the air that I'm breathing into my lungs. And what a gift it is. God, you're God of the green grass, and you're God of a thousand hills. God, you're a big God, and you're God of uh, power, and you have power over this thing that's frustrating me. And as I was thinking those thoughts about what a big God we have, I could literally feel my body just starting to go. And I'm starting to relax. And then in my head, ideas about the workaround of how to solve this problem just started to pop because instead of thinking about my own inadequacies and what a computer illiterate I am, I started thinking about what a big God I had. Yeah, blessed are the computer illiterate, right? <laughs> Isn't that cool? Blessed are the, the Macs and blessed are the Androids, right? <laughs> blessed are the iPhones and Androids. Anyway, things just started happening. No kidding. Physically, I could just feel the frustration leaving my body. My mind was just freed because I'm small. My problems are small, but God is big. And I, I thought of ways to just work around it. And when I worship, something happens to the way that I look at my life and my problems. And do you know this week you can do that? If statistics bear out, there's a number of you in this congregation and online right now that might be struggling. And this week, you have the ability to worship. When, when the fig tree doesn't bud, when, when the olive crop fails, when there's no sheep in the pen and the car doesn't start and the checkbook doesn't balance and the husband disappoints you and the wife offends you, when the sun doesn't shine and the boss doesn't smile, when the hope for a phone call doesn't come, when you're frustrated and you're sad and when you're discouraged, when you're stuck, just stop and try some, something like worship. And you can do this, and you can look out the window, and you can look at creation, and you can open up scriptures and read again some of the words from this person named Jesus. And you can sing hymns, and it goes way down deep inside of you, and you can remember Habakkuk. Nevertheless, God, I remember your greatness and your goodness, and I'm going to praise you right now. That's how people who are struggling in their marriages can keep continue on to go yet another day. And you can rely on the God that you have who is big and above all problems that we have. And this church, as long as I'm pastor of it, is going to be open for everyone. May God bless you. If you would, pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to worship in a kingdom where you are God and you are in control of all things and you're above all things. And Lord, we thank you that in troubled marriages, you are there. And in divorces, you are there. We thank you that you shine upon us, not because of our internal goodness, internal goodness, but because of the goodness of Jesus Christ, that goodness which you gave to us, not because we deserved it, earned it in any way, but just because you're such a good and loving God. Lord, thank you for sunshines. Thank you for dancing butterflies. Lord, thank you for turtles. <laughs> just thank you for the good things in life. Go with us this week, Lord, and when we face discouragement, whether inside or outside the marriage, just be with us and help us, Lord, to know that we are blessed. Thank you for Jesus Christ for making that possible. These things we pray in his name. Amen. All right.